what we're looking at here are some photographs that I made on Midway Island in the middle of the Pacific of baby albatross filled up with plastic. And uh, there's this incredibly heartbreaking and symbolic tragedy that's happening out there where parent albatrosses fly out over the vast polluted Pacific collecting plastic. They think they're collecting food to bring back to their babies and what they're actually are filling their stomach up with is is our cigarette lighters and bottle caps and toothbrushes and so on. And, uh, and they come back and they feed these things to their babies. And the babies literally fill up with plastic until they die of dehydration and starvation and um, punctures to their stomach. And uh, so the ground on Midway Island is covered with the bodies of tens of thousands of baby albatrosses that have died in this kind of horrendous way. Um, and I think it's... It's, it's a symbolic place that I really want to, uh, I want to kind of bring this tragedy out visually because this is where the Pacific Garbage Patch surfaces. The Pacific Garbage Patch is this uh, giant floating kind of uh, soup of plastic out in the Pacific Ocean. There are tens of millions of tons of plastic there in the ocean. And, uh, and so it's one of those invisible problems that's really hard to relate to. It's kind of like global warming that way. You know, you can't go stand in front of it. There's no Mount Everest of, of our garbage that, you know, we can go stand in front of and face, and Pacific garbage patches like that. And so this is one place where the plastic in the Pacific Ocean is surfacing in this incredibly macabre and symbolic way inside the stomachs of dead baby birds on one of the remotest marine sanctuaries on Earth. So early on in this process, when I got to Midway Island and began seeing these astonishing images of uh, birds filled with plastic, I realized pretty early on that people weren't going to trust the photographs. You know, they look like I put the plastic in there. They, it's, it's just so surreal that there would be birds filled with that much plastic anywhere in the world. And so what I decided to do really early on with this work was to make a rule for myself that I'm not going to add any plastic, but I'm also not going to move any of it around. There's going to be no arranging. So all of these images from the first series, first trip to Midway, are uh, straight documentary photography where none of the plastic was, was moved even a millimeter. One of the things that we discovered as we made, as I made these photographs, is, uh, you know, we started, first I'd take the picture and then we'd get a Ziploc bag and we'd collect all the plastic inside of one bird. And we discovered that underneath what you can see here, um, there, there's a depth to the plastic. It's like this deep inside the bird because the bird's stomach was shaped like a bag. And all you can see in these images where none of the plastic is moved is the very top of the pile of plastic that's inside the bird. And so, so the second time we went out there, which was just very recently, um, we spread out the plastic inside each bird manually. And so once the credibility of the project was kind of established and we really followed our, our rule the first time, then I thought it, it would be legitimate to take one additional step in that ethical process and, and allow myself to at least spread the plastic out, but without adding any additional. So we still stuck to that rule. And, uh, and the, some, you know, these, the, these photographs, are, are, they kind of take it one step more horrific than the previous series. Here's one that has a cigarette lighter, a large piece of a fishing float, a full toothbrush, a large uh, s uh, section of plastic pipe, and then maybe another 75 or 100 additional shards of plastic, including what looks like a piece of a toy robot right there. You know, I have this message that I really believe in, which is about facing the horrors of our time, allowing ourselves to know the reality of the time we live in, however hard that is, however much it hurts, or however much we feel grief or shame or uh, or anger or rage or whatever. I think we all have to, that's step number one, is to face the, the, the reality of our times. The impact that I hope this work has is as a kind of wake-up call. And uh, it's hard because I know these images are really horrible to look at. And what I don't want to have happen is for people to be traumatized by them, you know, and to fall into feelings of, of paralysis, of despair, or hopelessness. And I know um, facing an issue like this can, uh, it's really easy to go there. You know, it's easy to go into overwhelm. And, uh, and I don't want to 
to sort of go further down that road. And it's easy to kind of look at issues like this and, uh, and feel those feelings of, of despair. But you know, what I really believe is when we begin to process those emotions, when we allow ourselves to feel despair, allow ourselves to feel grief or anger or rage about what's happening in the world, to me, those are legitimate human responses to our times. And once we can connect with that, then maybe collectively we can begin to make new choices.